All right. So very briefly, this will be this room will be the explainable AI track, which is uh, maybe a little bit of an outdated term or, or not a, a completely accurate term because we're also going to be talking about uh, social bias in AI and things like model debugging and things like regulation. So uh, we have an incredible lineup of speakers, uh, researchers who have invented the most sort of seminal techniques in the field. We have representatives from regulatory agencies. We have pure mathematicians, uh, business practitioners. So hang around. I think, I think you're in for a really good show. Uh, I'm, I'm Patrick Hall. I, I don't know. I do something at H2O. I'm never quite sure what. Uh, I kind of lead the interpretability uh, endeavor from, let's say, a research and marketing perspective, but certainly not an engineering perspective. So uh, Mateusz is hiding back there somewhere. He's, he's the engineer who's responsible, and his team is responsible for all the cool stuff I might show. I'm a horrible engineer. Um, so, so without any further ado, let's, let's talk about increasing trust and understanding in machine learning with, with model debugging, or I think the, the official title was the case for model debugging. So what, what is this thing, model debugging? All right, um, I'd say it's kind of an emergent discipline. I don't, I don't think it's strictly defined yet. Um, it, it ports over a lot of best practices from software testing because I mean, when the machine learning model is executed, it's some kind of computer code almost always, or some kind of stored binary executable thing that can be tested like we test other computer software. Um, one thing I really want to communicate clearly is that model debugging focuses on trust, okay? So the last two H2O worlds and all over the world, I've been blabbing about explainability and transparency and machine learning. Those things, that, that's about understanding machine learning. And today I want to talk about trusting machine learning. And I think they're, they're, they overlap. They certainly overlap, but they're a little bit different. So, you know, I, I think that there's several ways to think about this, right? We, we have tools in machine learning that I would argue promote trust, and we have tools that I would argue more promote understanding. And just a really simple thought experiment for, um, for why these things are different. So who took an airplane here? Uh, who took a well, I shouldn't raise my hand. Who took a train here? Okay, who went over a suspension bridge to get here? Who went under a tunnel to get here? All right, now raise your hand if you have a really deep understanding of how airplanes or modern locomotives or tunnels or suspension bridges work. Okay, so we can trust things that we don't understand and sometimes when we understand things, it makes us not trust them, okay? So, so that's just a simple thought experiment for why these two concepts are slightly different. Now, they certainly overlap. They certainly overlap. Um, and I would say debugging is focused on trust. And when I go through that debugging process, I might happen to learn something about my model and understand it better as kind of a side effect of that debugging process. All right. And, and, you know, I'm making this statement, I really do think these things are technically feasible today. And, and another thing is, is uh, and, and hopefully I'll convince you throughout the, the talk, you really need to do this. Machine learning models create these really complex response surfaces that can have logical errors in them. Uh, they're, they're hackable. Um, and, and they can be, soci you know, they can have, they can perpetuate unwanted sociological bias, okay? So, so those are the things that we're going to be watching out for. Errors in terms of like runtime errors when I execute the model, logical errors in the model's code or the, or the binary that defines the model, um, unwanted sociological bias, and, um, and the, the security of the model itself. Okay. So why, why, why do this extra testing, right? We already look at AUC, we look at precision recall curves, we do grid searches, we do this, that, and the other. So um, the way this presentation is set up, I trained this model in a way that I thought was, was good. Um, and certainly I would, you know, I, I teach at GW and some of my former students are here. I would certainly have given them an A if, if they had brought me something like this. Uh, but, but, when we think about the complexity of machine learning and we think about how it's actually deployed in the real world, 
Sadly, these metrics and these processes that we're using are um, you know, insufficient, let's see, to, to guarantee trust in the model. Okay, so, so here's a kind of technical example of, of how I can explain to you why not to trust something, all right? And forgive me, I'm gonna have to go through it kind of quickly. So this is again, you know, this model isn't accurate. I'm gonna explain to you why, which would probably cause you to understand why you should not trust this model. So, so sometimes when we see explanations of a model, it makes us not trust the model, okay? And I would argue that that's what's going on here. And, and so there's just a major problem with this model that I thought I did such a good job training. All right, so we can see that variable importance chart. And we see this pay zero variable, someone's most recent repayment status. It's maybe four times more important than uh, the other variables, okay? So the model is really keying in on this. Now, if I look at the residuals, what I can see is a pattern where uh, when someone has a good pay zero status, I, um, and, and they, they do default, I get these huge residuals, okay? So the model's really keyed in on their most recent repayment status. Their most recent repayment status is good, and then they default, and then the model gives me these huge residuals, okay? It's just not taking anything else into consideration. And you can also see the converse. So I have a bad re most recent repayment status, but then I do go ahead and repay my bill, I get huge residuals in the other direction. So what I've done is um, spent a long time training an incredibly simple rule-based system. That's the problem here, okay? I built a machine learning model when really all I needed was one rule, okay? So, so we're bringing undue complexity into our world, which is just evil, okay? It, it makes it easier to hack, it, it perpetuates bias potentially, uh, and, and now we have to go looking for all these complex errors. So I'm not saying this is such a horrible model. What I'm saying is I've trained a machine learning model, but what that model learned was basically one rule. But, but there's probably 100,000 or more rules in, in my score code for this model. Okay, so, um, why, why debug? Again, Lyft, AUC, ASE, they don't tell us anything about whether the model is exhibiting uh, sociological bias, okay? They, they just don't. Now, if you look at those over, you know, if you look at those across demographic segments, you might be taking a baby step towards seeing that, okay? And since this is H2O world, I'm, I'm supposed to demo some H2O stuff, so bear with me. Um, we, do, we do support, uh, this disparate impact analysis. This is kind of a traditional approach to testing for bias, which um, is a good first step for machine learning, but I'd like to point out some things to be wary of in addition to this. So uh, what we see here is a few different error metrics calculated across different demographic groups. So I said, just looking at the overall lift doesn't tell us anything about whether the model's perpetuating bias. But if I start breaking the model down and looking at the error accuracy across groups and looking for wide differences in those figures, then that can start cluing me in to whether I'm perpetuating sociological bias with my machine learning model. And let me just give you a real quick uh, view of what that looks like with H2O. Okay. So this is a machine learning model that, that has already been trained, and we can look at things like the adverse impact ratio, okay? And I know that's a little bit hard to see, but, but men are orange and women are blue, okay? And that little number above men says point, uh, 0.33, and then the little number above women says 0.29. So what do those numbers mean? Well, those are, those are the number of people in those two groups, men and women, who experienced a harmful outcome from the model, okay? And so what we're saying, they were denied the loan. In this basic sort of toy credit, score, credit scoring example, they were denied the loan. So about 29% um, of women were denied the loan and about 33% of men were denied the loan. So from kind of a 30,000 foot, um, not in a compliance setting, fairness perspective, we're, we're already in good shape. The model is giving more loans to what would be the um, protected class, okay? The men, would, we would assume if there's, if there's positive bias in the data, it would be towards men, and we can see that our model already is actually making more loans towards women. So that's good to start with. 
we also can highlight automatically um, if, so I said we wanted to look at error or accuracy across different demographic groups. And if they are more than 20% different, that's, that's a basic key that something bad is going on, okay? So what I can do, just to give you an example of what that might look like, I'm gonna switch over to marital status. And I'm going to use married as the reference, so we're gonna be comparing everything to married. And now you can see, I do have, we are flagging these sort of disparate error values, okay? So my model is having diff different kinds of error across uh, the different sociological groups in my model. And that's an indicator that my model is perpetuating sociological bias, okay? Um, and we're flagging it because it's orange. I know that's probably hard to see, but it's orange down there. So that's an example of what it looked like if we would pick up on this. Why is this happening? That's always a very tricky question, but one very obvious thing here is this divorce group and the other marital status, they have no data. And we'll talk about that later. So. If you don't have data in your data set about a certain group of people, the model won't learn about them accurately. And I don't, you know, that's just a fundamental fact that we're dealing with. Okay, so we don't want bias models. Traditional assessment doesn't tell us much about perpetuating sociological bias. Okay, so your machine learning model can be hacked. Now, if you work in a bank and it's behind, you know, some, some normal, or, or even better than normal IT security, uh, you know, security protections, then, then you probably don't have to worry about this, at least today. Uh, I expect that these attacks will become more and more prominent in the future. I know this is impossible to read, so you can download a full-size image at that address. Um, but there are several different ways that hackers can attack machine learning models directly. And one attack that, that I'm particularly fond of talking about because it's so scary, is a, what's called a membership inference attack. And um, that's, when, that's when a hacker can tell if a row of data was used in your training set. And so if you, full, if you follow that attack out to its fullest extent, uh, then the people can just rebuild your training data, okay? Just, just from pinging your machine learning API. And there, there are published academic papers about this. Now, like I said, if you're working in a company with some basic defenses, you're probably okay. If I can't hit your model a million times a second, uh, if I have to authenticate to use your model, these attacks become much harder. But I don't think people think about machine learning as a, as a hacking target as often as they should, okay? So we've talked about sociological bias. Normal assessment doesn't tell us anything about that. We've talked about hacking. Normal assessment doesn't tell us anything about that. I'll throw out one more hacking example because I think it's fun. So there's something called, um, there's something called a, a data poisoning attack. And this would be kind of an insider attack. I can subtly, if I'm the data scientist, you know, that, that I've been given way too many permissions because my boss just wants machine learning to happen no matter what, um, I can just change the training data in subtle ways and get whatever outcome I want out of the model. So if I work at a fintech, I can just change the training data to give my girlfriend or mother or friend a giant loan. And there's really, you know, I don't, I don't think people are thinking about this and certainly the lift of the model won't tell you if that's happened or not. Uh, one basic protection that you can think about is how easy it is to model your model from the outside and we have a little bit of that in driverless AI. So if I scroll down, I see this really unassuming line down here. It says random forest, RMSE 0.03, R squared 0.94. So what this tells me is I've trained this complex, crazy machine learning model, and yet um, one random forest can, can model the predictions very accurately. Okay, so this is a random forest built between the original inputs to the system and the outputs of the system, okay? And it's a single random forest, just one random forest, nothing fancy, and uh, I can just have all your proprietary business logic if your API isn't protected. So I can just submit random data to your API, get predictions back, train a model between the random data I submitted and the predictions, and now I have a copy of your proprietary business logic. So. We have a little bit of this in here just telling you that this, this sort of indicates that that would be possible, okay? Not, not easy, but possible. All right, where do my slides go? All right, so 
how do we debug models? I think it's really important that it's part of sort of a holistic process. Um, you know, if, if I train some incredibly complex 90 layer deep learning model and then I do a couple little debugging strategies on it, that's not gonna get me anywhere, right? Um, if, I, if I train the most accurate sort of interpretable model in the world but I don't do any debugging, then I'm, then I'm stuck with all those problems that I mentioned earlier, right? Your model's potentially biased, it's potentially hackable, it's potentially inaccurate. Um, so I don't have much time left, I just kinda wanna hit some highlights. Uh, here's this, so here's a highlight, okay? Very often times we, we don't think about where our data is sparse. So here's that same lending example. I have all this data for people who behave well. So pay zero um, less than two, which are, all, which are the good repayment codes. Not shockingly, I don't have very much data for, for um, people who aren't paying their loans back. And how can the machine learning model know anything about those people, right? They're, they're, that, that part of the data set is sparse. So we need to check for that. And, and the way you would fix this is get more data or potentially simulate more data. Um, so keep in mind, your training data can have these sparse places and your model's not gonna perform well there. Uh, we, do, we do support sensitivity analysis and sensitivity analysis is, is one of the just easiest ways to check a model's behavior. And um, here's one of these, and, and by sensitivity analysis I mean just simulating data or taking data that looks interesting, running it through your model and seeing how it behaves. It's that simple, okay? And I always like to point out that when we worked with linear models, we knew what would happen if I put a big, uh, an out of domain uh, value into the model. It just extrapolates linearly. But with a machine learning model, you don't know what it's gonna do unless you've tested it, okay? So it could do something crazy. It could do something that you're not expecting at all. And so, so this just represents a simulation visualized by several different of the important variables. And I wanna point out what I would argue is, is potentially a logical flaw in the model. So um, here, no matter, no matter how much someone pays on their first payment, even above their credit limit. So let's say my credit limit was $10,000, um, but I was two months late, but I paid back a million dollars. This machine learning model still says I'll default. Okay, it's a logical error in, in the machine learning model. I would argue that's a logical error in the machine learning model. And you can fix that by post-processing, business rules. Or if you wanna sound cool, you can say model assertions. So I can have a model assertion that says, hey, um, if you've paid 10 times your credit limit, then don't issue a default prediction, something like that. All right, uh, let me show, this, this is a new thing that people worked really hard on in, in driverless AI. Um, so we do have the ability to sort of play with models now. And um, the basic idea is I can just take a, take a variable. Uh, I'm gonna make everybody two, two months late. And I'm gonna rescore. And I'm gonna see that my predictions are gonna shoot up, right? Like I can do basic, I can do basic stress testing. And, uh, and I can see my average prediction went up by about 39%, all right? So that's, that's a huge problem, right? I have this one value I can change in my model and drastically change the whole outcome. All right, my time is up. I'll be around if you have questions later and I need to introduce the next speaker. So thanks a lot.